Welcome to the Changing Leicester Exhibition. With the discovery of the body of King Richard III, there has been an increasing fascination with Leicester's 2,000-year history. Evidence of the city's past surrounds us in its buildings and even its street layout, which dates from both Roman and medieval times. Until relatively recently, the city didn't have a master plan for development. Buildings were demolished and put up randomly as the needs of the city evolved. Today, Victorian warehouses sit alongside concrete office blocks, and medieval buildings are neighbours of factories. It was the latter years of the Industrial Revolution, however, that had the most impact on the city. A market town developed into an industrial powerhouse full of factories and warehouses, alongside the housing and transport networks needed to support them. What we consider to be of historical value and what we consider to be part of our heritage has changed considerably in the last 70 years. This presentation looks at changes in the laws regarding town planning and more specifically, how that has shaped Leicester. What we value about our past and consider worth preserving has been heavily influenced by the work of organisations with a specific interest in heritage conservation. Increasing public pressure has contributed to changes in the law, which have meant that archaeologists have more time and opportunity to investigate sites under development. This has helped us to build up a picture of our past and stimulate a sense of civic pride and a sense of place. We have interviewed many people with an interest or role in the way that Leicester looks today and how our past informs our present. The first voice you will hear is that of the architect Douglas Smith. Douglas did much of his early work in the 1960s and 1970s. This is the era many people associate with the city planner Konrad Smigielski. And here is the view of someone who worked with and for him. When I set up in practice in 1960, the town plan and the planning authority was under the city engineer that had their criteria of density and zoning of properties. And that would have been terribly restricting. Fortunately, when you start in practice, well, when I started in practice, my workload was a lot of housing. And then suddenly the government changed the policy on local authority and housing to, to uh, let with the housing associations, the housing corporation. And I became a committee member with an estate agent, a solicitor, and I was the architect for Leicester Housing Association and Leicester Housing Society, both of them. And suddenly you were doing a lot of work. Fortunately for me, and I think for Leicester, they appointed the first planning officer, which was Smigelski. Conrad Smigelski was appointed in 62. He had wild ideas, that were, which were good because it made people sit up and think, and also enabled him to do what he really wanted to do. And they could concentrate on high-level connections between the city centre and Wixon and Mopey and so on, with monorails and things like that, which well, part of it, he would have loved to have done it, I'm sure, but it, it wasn't the main aim. And he looked at the plans and he said, the inner ring road is ridiculous. It's going through the new walk at road level. It's going straight through the middle of the Crescent, one of the few good buildings, and more or less over my dead body will this road go there. Douglas Smith was involved in some of the 1970s housing schemes initiated under Konrad Smigielski. Because it's so much per dwelling, so we could compete with all the developers. The Leicester Housing Association be became significant players in lots of parts of Leicester because we were using the quality of design. Smigielski was uh, very happy with this and his, his new inner circle, Black Niki and so on, we enjoyed a good relationship and in fact the original Beaumont Lees development in the middle, we won 
the whole of the first section, which included spec builders in the middle area of uh, Leicester Housing Association. And we did a big block, which was off the beam, really. For me, he was the refreshing planning officer that worked, as I thought, when uh, the disastrous, when he was uh, in 72, when he was kicked out. Konrad Smigielski was perhaps the most controversial of the city's planners. In this local television news coverage from 1968, he explains his plans for the overhaul of the market and marketplace. Look at this. This is Leicester Marketplace, the commercial heart of this city. A magnificent civic square, but what about this roof? Ugly roof, like over a goods station. It was built in 1930, but in the historic past, it was an exciting civic square, used not only for the market, but also for political and civic occasions. We intend to modernize this and we have a scheme. Uh, to put it uh, very briefly, we want to create a small square in front of this corn exchange to open up the view towards this historic building. And we intend to build a new, attractive and colorful roof over there. Michael Taylor talks about the role of the conservation officer in the modern era. So you kind of feel very much a kind of under siege because there's a lot of work. You're, you're fielding all the conservation inquiries from the city. Also, it's, it's necessary, and you have to be aware that it's a, it's a detail of a detail in terms of the council's overall services. So you have to be aware of which councillors, for example, are interested in what you're doing and, and carefully cultivate them if you, when you get the opportunity if only by you know, making extra special effort to reply to their inquiries and, mm. and so on. So, as I say, as a conservation officer, and, I, and I, you know, when I stopped being a conservation officer and I was dealing with them from the outside, I, I, I noticed this in, in others. You kind of feel it's, you know, it's, it's, it's after in you know, while and deluge, you know, it's, um, you're, you're holding back the sort of time and barbarism you know, all on your own. So I suppose that was my attitude then, that it was down to me to, to save Leicester's heritage. In this clip... Michael talks about the highly controversial Eastern Relief Road. Just after I started, the Eastern Relief Road was cancelled. And that I hadn't, didn't appreciate at the time, but that had been a case that had run on for years and would have had an immensely damaging effect on, on South Highfields and the Eddington footpath area and also the area behind St James's Church, where it would have been you know, just bashed a big dual carriageway road through that part of the city. So I didn't when I you know when when colleagues colleagues older colleagues who knew more about this than I did said gosh you know these relief roads have been cancelled I didn't really fully understand what the impact of that was. Smigielski couldn't do much about the the Broadway Burley's Way uh, part of the inner ring road, but a road that would have cut through the Crescent and, and cut across New Walk from the direction of the station uh, towards Welford Road uh, was had been cancelled by. By, not by Smigielski, but during his time there, and uh, that would have been immensely damaging, damaging to heritage. Peter Little has had a long career in archaeology, including time as the archaeological survey officer. Here he talks about some of the archaeological work carried out during the 1970s in Leicester. At that point, the, the, the half a dozen people were employed as uh, field officers for the archaeological unit and then a new job of archaeological survey officer was also created, which I was lucky enough to, to get. There were other responsibilities as well, like trying to get archaeology more involved in the planning process, doing a survey in the county to actually find out what we knew about Leicestershire and expand that and, and work with volunteers and that was, that was a major part of, of my work then for the next well still is now 40 years later really so we set up the archaeological Leisure Museum's archaeological fieldwork group we called it then it's now called the Leisure Fieldworkers and 
which is celebrating its 40th year uh, in existence this year. And so we were excavating in advance of that, again, catching a bit of the Roman Forum. Uh, there were also smaller excavations at that time, at places like um, the chapel of Wigson's Hospital uh, in, um, next to the cathedral. Um, and we did smaller things along Churchgate as they were ch changing the road network a little bit there and dotted about the city centre at that point. And then from 73, the, there was a big, what they called, slum clearance, but in fact was knocking down perfectly decent Victorian terraced houses, in my mind, on the west side of the River Saw, along King Richard's Road and Narborough Road. So they started sort of knocking down a huge chunk there, and we were involved in excavations at, at the Austin Friars site, you know, Big Friary, which in fact they never really built on afterwards. Richard Buckley has worked as a field officer for Leicestershire County Council and is currently co-director of the University of Leicester Archaeological Services. He explains how the status of archaeology changed dramatically in the 1990s with new planning guidelines. But then from about 1990, I became more of a sort of project manager, looking at the impact of new buildings on archaeology, deciding on a strategy for excavation, and then setting up a fieldwork project. So 1990 was a turning point. Ironically, the first big site turned out to be the same site I'd done in 1980, but the other end of it, and that led to... At that time, the, first, the biggest excavation ever done in Leicester, where, when the, um, before the Inland Revenue Building was built on Causeway. So that was the first site that was under Planning Policy Guidance 16, which, which basically meant that developers had to pay when they were threatening archaeology. Anne Graff remembers her role in archaeology in the 1980s and events that changed public perception. The archaeology survey team received the weekly lists of planning applications when the conservation officers at County Hall had finished with them and I used to see these floating around the office during the 1980s and nobody actually did much with them and I occasionally glanced at them and spotted a site that looked a bit of a development would threaten the, some archaeological remains and contacted conservation officers at County Hall to find out what one did about this. And it turned out it was too late anyway, because they sent the lists only when they'd finished with dealing with them. And by that time, the committees had sat and made the decisions and given the planning permission, and it was not possible to make any further comment. So first thing was that I then thought, well, if they would agree, we'd arranged for all the district councils and the counties, minerals and roads, highways, through the districts, to send the lists directly to Jury Wall to my attention when they came out, so that then there was a chance to comment in time and to assess the lists and the de proposed developments. And that's how it all started. So this rescue situation was was drastic in the 60s and 70s and 80s, post-war development. So that was a crying scandal. And then things in 1980s came to a head with the Temple of Mithras, for instance, in London, and um, the Rose Theatre, also in London, where these caught the national imagination. And thousands of people were interested and anxious that they should be recorded and protected. And so gradually they, they came to be a change in the climate of opinion throughout the country and in government. And eventually in 1990, the DOE issued Planning Policy Guidance Note 16 for Archaeology and Planning, which was the miracle document. That, for the first time, gave statutory powers for protection of archaeology. Up till that time, the only legal protection that was possible was for planning authorities to put a condition on a planning permission for the developer to be required to allow access for archaeological recording when it suited his program of course. How much can archaeology tell us about the city's past? Richard Buckley offers his view. 
one of the very major breakthroughs has been discovering Leicester's Anglo-Saxon past. We'd always suspected that the Anglo-Saxons came after the Romans withdrew in the 5th, 6th century, and we had bits of pottery but no structures. And then the High Cross excavations were so large that finally we started to pick up Anglo-Saxon buildings. So a whole episode in Leicester's history has now come to the fore from that. And I think what, what I quite like to do is not just to talk about Richard III, but force people to learn a little bit about Leicester. So a bit of background on Roman and medieval Leicester to set the scene. So I'm hoping that, that you know, people will now have heard of us and even uh, in America can actually pronounce the name Leicester <laughs> at last. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, but I think, yeah, it's very rewarding. And people say, well, don't you get bored, about, bored of talking about Richard III? Well, no, not really, because I think you, you still sense that excitement from people. You know, when, when you tell them a story, it's a great, it's a gift of a story to be able to tell to people. You know, the fact that we were so lucky in terms of finding them as quickly as we did. From the 1970s, some of the City Council's development plans began to face organised opposition. Sir Peter Salisbury describes his campaigning on housing issues at the time. In the early 1970s, 69, 70. And, uh, you know, that's what Leicester, what was happening in Leicester at the time. Uh, they were still doing so-called slum clearance. They were building new estates and they were continuing to make way for the motor car. By then, the underpass and big stretch of the ring road had already been built and quite a lot of the damage that did had already been caused. But there were still grandiose road schemes and massive slum clearance. And... As a result of that, you know, big areas of terrace housing were being left, boarded up, semi-derelict, and large parts of the inner city, particularly of Highfields, were significantly blighted. And that became part of the early political campaigns I was involved in uh, after being elected to seek to prevent the bulldozer making way for high-rise and deck-access flats, and to prevent the bulldozer making way for grandiose road. And that campaign was very, very significant in that we used that as the platform to campaign not just against the road, but against some clearance in generally, which uh, had really gone from clearing slums to clearing terrace housing that was, in fact, for many people, their home and their community. So... The battle to stop the bulldozer was uh, an essential part of what we were involved in in the early part of the 1970s, and we were very successful indeed. The Eastern Relief Road was stopped. Quite a bit of the damage that was being done by the West Bridge scheme was, was also stopped, not all of it. And we managed as group of newly elected, quite young councillors, to, well, really to stop the bulldozer. We managed to get the controlling Labour group on the council to dramatically change its policy and to move away from the one that had existed before that of improving only the very best terrace housing, Clarendon Park, Lansdowne Road, being general improvement areas, to one of focusing on the worst first in the housing in the inner city, the terrace housing particularly in the inner city, and making the demolition of houses the, the absolute last resort. Local individuals and local societies have a vital role to play in the planning process. Stuart Bailey talks about his role in Leicester Civic Society and their campaigns to protect and preserve local heritage. I'd be six or seven, I suppose, when the sack of Leicester started and when it became intolerable, at which stage I was 22, and that's when I joined the Civic Society. But I remember a lot about buildings that uh, people either don't believe they, they existed or I'm making it up or it's just a memory. I vividly remember the Central Station. I remember being taken to the Royal Opera House. My grandfather, who died when I was five, used to tell me that he'd taken me to the palace, but I don't remember that. And of course, I wouldn't personally remember it. I certainly remember being taken to behind the palace, the floral hall, because that was in use as a cinema. Most civic societies are 
originate with a lot of people who didn't don't like what's going on. Someone is saying, no, that's enough, stop, right? And Leicester's no, that's enough, stop, was a silly proposal by the City Council to demolish everything between the High Street and the Marketplace, to build a multi-storey car park, to connect with the market one side and the new shopping centre to be built the other side of High Street, which eventually was the Shires, now the High Cross. The other side, with pedestrian bridges over, like those dreadful ones that were eventually built over the Humberston Gate and Charles Street. And of course you'll appreciate this was a big chunk of the only surviving ancient quarter of the city. Has the nature of town development changed? Sir Peter Soulsby talks about the new approach to development involved in the Leicester Lanes and St Martin's shopping area schemes. The first step towards that was the City Council creatively using the land that it had acquired as part of the purchases in the Lanes area, Lowsby Lane uh, particularly, uh, using part of that land. They bought big chunks of Lowsby Lane, Kank Street, uh, Silver Street, in order to knock them down to make a multi-storey car park. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do it, they really had. Uh, and, but that did mean, and that was part of making way for the motor car, but that did mean that the council had a big stake in the area and was able to bring together the backland behind uh, Lowesby Lane to tempt in the Bass Pension Fund and Teesland to develop what is now the St Martin's shopping area which I think set a very important precedent because it was bringing new investment in, but it was bringing it in in a way that was sensitive to the grain of the historic buildings that surrounded it and retained a lot of them. So the whole of the frontages were retained. Some um, access was, uh, was made, uh, obviously, uh, just the top end of Kank Street by where the historic Kank Well was and also through an archway onto, uh, onto Silver Street. But essentially it went with the grain of the, of, the, of the development and that was a major breakthrough in, I think uh, perhaps you know, the planning began 82, 83, so now, I think it was 85, 86. And that in turn set the template for what was done when the Shire's development took place. The Victorian Society has also had a major influence on preserving Leicester's heritage. Rowan Ronish talks about Highfields and her role in campaigning for a conservation area designation. Within a year, I was living in Highfields and I just couldn't believe the fabulous architecture in Highfields. These terrace streets, because there had been there were what had been in the previous years, a whole program of knocking terraced houses down and rebuilding council estates. And of course, the estate, the big estate in Highfields, had had been completed and in an area that had been terraced housing. And I was living up near Spinney Hill Park. And those big houses around Spinney Hill Park, they are fabulous. So I began researching who the architects of those houses were. And I was so shocked by the decay that some of them were going through that I put an, I, w I had by that time joined the Victorian Society, which had been going for a few years. And uh, through the Victorian Society, put an application into the then conservation officer, asking him if he would make Spinney Hill Park and the and the, ha and the terraced houses round. And I actually meant the streets as well as the bigger houses, because to me, planning is about where you put things, and the big houses are just part of a broader planning thing. So I asked, we asked for them to be made a conservation area. It was the first act of con conservation that I was involved in when I came to Leicester, which must have been 1982, it was declared. So we did this. Um, and over that period, we managed to get over 50 buildings listed in Leicester. And that's across the board. That's coffee houses, banks, all kinds of buildings, commercial buildings, uh, offices, uh, churches, all sorts of things. And that was in that period, 1990 to about 2008. 
I also sat on the City Council's Conservation Advisory Panel, and again, that was about sitting in there and arguing the case for a particular planning application either being appropriate or inappropriate. It was an advisory panel, so uh, the committee might be absolutely unanimous that something shouldn't happen or should happen, but when it came to committee, that was just a piece of advice from one small corner of the world, and often you were quite frustrated that it wasn't taken more seriously. Richard Buckley remembers his childhood impressions of Leicester and a state of change. We used to go into Leicester every Saturday, I think, to go shopping, and we would park on Vaughan Way, and you'd sort of walk through those streets where the High Cross Centre is now, which then was full of things like the the Fielding Johnson spinning mills and all of these sort of dark industrial buildings. So I didn't see much evidence of any medieval in the usual sort of route we went into the middle of town. But I think what, what the big revelation for me was when they started to build the underpass, because we, we would often go to see relatives on the other side of town, and we'd go along what's now Vaughan Way, and before the underpass you'd go around St Nicholas Circle. And what I remember is, is when they were doing all the demolition of the buildings in that area in preparation for the underpass and everything, seeing this little timber frame building suddenly, a bit of it, peep out from behind all these other buildings with this leaded window sort of hanging off its hinges. And I was absolutely thrilled to see this thing, this little remnant of something very old hidden behind all the buildings. So I knew about that one, which turned out to be Wigson's house, I think as children we were quite excited by, goodness knows why now, but things like the construction of the Haymarket Centre and all these modern things and the, the sort of promise that we'd see in the papers of, the, of a monorail going up Charles Street, things like that, which never happened. In recent years, archaeology has had a far more prominent public profile than media impact. Richard Buckley explains. So a major impact on, on buried archaeology but which isn't necessarily negative things. We've learned a huge amount about Leicester's Roman and medieval past in particular. And let's be honest, a lot of the buried archaeology isn't that well preserved. And the public will often say, oh, isn't it a shame that you've, this has all been destroyed and you've not put it all on display so we can walk around it thinking it's like Pompeii or Herculaneum. And it isn't. It's Leicester's archaeology is heavily disturbed so each generation's work disturbs the work of previous generations. Building materials are recycled and all that. And so very often buildings don't survive as masonry structures. They're just ghost lines of walls and fragments of floors and things. So it's, you know, the fact that we've actually had a chance to explore and investigate these things is a major breakthrough, really. I think probably one of the biggest impacts on the public, the earliest one, was really the Norfolk Street Roman Villa. I was lucky enough to do two seasons on that, working under John Lucas. But the, 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 first, the second season there, they had a public open day, and I think something like 3,000 people turned up. So in terms of impact, that was absolutely huge. We've never achieved it since, really. But that was a major thing. And then the Shires Shopping Centre, the two excavations that John and I did there, we, were, we had more or less open access to the public, so they could walk walk through one of the sites and go on a viewing platform on the other. So during the year, 100,000 odd people saw it. Like any city, Leicester has changed and evolved. Councillor Adam Clark discusses balancing the need for city development and the concern for protecting our heritage. There's always a delicate balance, isn't there? And that's why, that's why we talk about sustainable development in a lot of ways. It is that, you know, you need to... I mean, that's a kind of multi... Kind of uh, multifaceted, very sustainable development, but I'd, inc I'd include heritage within that. I mean, you know, you need to for it to be sustainable. It needs to be cost-effective, but it also needs to kind of there also needs to be a sense of place as well, which was one of my concerns about High Cross when that went up. Actually, you know, is this really Leicester? Gradually, it's becoming Leicester in terms of you know what the city mayor's um, kind of achievement is. is, is it, there's, there's so much there about having a self-confident city. So the people in the city who have a sense of place, I think, are likely to be more confident. And therefore, heritage is an important part of that. You know, people who live in this city have come from, you know, many different backgrounds, many different places, many different, and been on many different journeys. Leicester's citizens form close connections to the buildings around them.
Linda Turner and Ranjan Sorjani talk about important landmarks, those that are still with us and those that are gone. I think the Humberston Gate demolition of the Bell Hotel to build the Haymarket Shopping Centre in the 70s, that seemed to be a vandalism really of the beautiful old building that was there. And I think they could have, if they had the right mindset, they could have preserved it really. And you perhaps used it for a different use, but preserved the facade at least anyway. But what they built really wasn't very attractive. Although having the theatre in the town centre itself right in the middle was a very good idea because people used it. There was a car park at the rear. You know, lots of uh, famous people played there, groups there. So it was good to have that sort of venue right in the city centre itself. But on, on a personal level, the flyover was like the landmark for us um, as a community because that's where the Asian community settled in Belgrave and then moved on to Sest and Rashmid, you know, other areas, Burstall and so on. But the flyover was a real landmark. So if we had relatives coming from anywhere, London or any other town, and, you know, must remember at this time people were trying to find other people that they knew in Uganda but had heard they were in Leicester and so was asking people and so on. The landmark we used to give come to the flyover, if you come to Leicester, because in those days we weren't rich enough to have, I don't know whether, you know, the maps, um, so it was by asking word of mouth. There were no sat nerves. So landmark was the Belgrave flyover. And I think it played a very major part in terms of a landmark that, that was known to people where we settled. You know, you would settle... You hear histories about how settlements started on the bank of a river, or this is like settlements started near Belgrave flyover. Councillor Adam Clark takes a different view. I'm a big fan of Lee Circle Car Park. I think it's a beautiful building, and I've grown to love it. And I think it's and it says something about Leicester. It's got great in terms of its architecture. It's it's interesting. Double helix design as a car park, and it produced the first you know one of the first automatic car park in the country and it had Britain's largest supermarket underneath it when it was first built. It was opened by Sid James. It's just fantastic, you know, what a fantastic piece of heritage. And that, if you walk under the um, Burley's flyover now, it looks like a ship. It's like, it looks like um, the ribbing of a ship and if you walk under it. And you can, actually can see that actually somebody has thought about the aesthetics of this thing. And it's the same with Belgrave flyover. The problem with Belgrave flyover is it didn't serve much of a purpose in terms of traffic management and it did divide the Golden Mile from the city centre. We are now almost at the end of this presentation, which we hope you have enjoyed. Leicester has seen many changes in its buildings and streets, but many things remain the same. Semper idem, as the city motto says. We are going to give the final word to Konrad Smigielski, Chief Planning Officer from 1962 to 1972, who explores what he thinks makes Leicester the city it is. What sort of city is Leicester? To put it in a nutshell, on the one side is a provincial, typical English city. But on the other hand, it is also unique in certain respects. Architecturally, it is not very impressive. But behind that unimpressive facade, Leicester certainly is not a Florence. There are certain lasting values. For example, willingness to accept new ideas, uh, tolerance, religious, political, racial.